The online world, they have a lot of trouble with this, as well as the world in general. They do not believe in the King James Bible being the perfect, pure Word of God. They think that all other Bibles are okay, that there's not a big uh, issue. Uh, some of them try to stick to the Mandela effect, or uh, they'll try to argue for textual criticism, etc., to renounce the King James Bible and to point out its fallacies. So it is very important that you have to believe the King James Bible is perfect, and if you're not within a movement or within a church that does not believe in final authority, a perfect Bible, then you're going to live the rest of your life in a church and within a movement where you don't properly grow. You might say, why is that? Because to grow in right doctrine, you ha where you learn the right doctrines from? The Bible. You cannot learn right doctrine from the Bible if you have the wrong Bible. Now, can you learn some doctrine? Of course, you can learn some doctrine, but you're not going to get deeper. You're not going to get all the right doctrines. So that's why it's so important to have final authority. Believe the King James Bible is perfect. Amen. So I know a lot of people have trouble with this issue. What I'm going to do is in lots of other videos, I pointed out doctrinal errors and then I've done it at an intellectual level. But the problem with people, which becomes so amazing to me, is that they don't study. That's the problem. They don't study. Uh, they don't see it. So what I'm going to do is try to deal with the basic, most basic level, the most common sense level, where it should convince a person, both amateur and scholar alike. Okay? Now, let's look at Revelation chapter 22, and we'll start verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Now, I have a very simple question. Let's not make this complicated. Do you believe in this verse? Yes or no? Okay, yes. you believe in this verse. Okay, yes. it's that simple. Now, believing in this verse, then we understand here this. Can we all agree God does not like it when His words are added? Correct? And God does not like it when His words are subtracted. Can you agree with that? Okay, if we all agree with that, then why can't we denounce all these modern Bible versions? There is no doubt you see words subtracted, you see words added. Now, some people might say, well, the King James Bible is missing some words too, or they added some words. No, the point is this. The point is you can't judge which words are missing and added until you believe a right Bible somewhere. Amen. Why? When you believe and have the right Bible... Then you can judge all the other Bibles, which ones are missing words, which ones are adding. Why? Because if you have no right Bible to judge it, then how do you know what's adding or what's subtracting? All you have is abstract, invisible, made-up made up belief on what should be added and subtracted. See that? So you need final authority. You need a perfect Bible so that you can judge for yourself which words are added and subtracted. Now the common argument that you're going to hear is this, is that, well, uh, the other argument is, I, I, I realize that, yeah, w words out of the Bible being added or subtracted, that should not be the case. But um, what that means is all the Bibles, the words may be different, but all modern Bible version Bibles, those are the Word of God. They all might be different. They just have different flavors and uh, different perspectives. They're all different wordings, but that's the Word of God. Then my question to them is this, okay? My question to them is, then which are the words in verse 18 and 19 that are added and subtracted? Tell me, come on, tell me, what if, if it's not NIV, if it's not ESV, if it's not this, then what are they? Tell me. Some might argue, well, it's the Book of Mormon, or it's the Koran, or it's um, the Catholic works, or the Jehovah Witness Bible. They might argue that way. 
wait a minute here. Okay, my question to them again is this, is that why would you consider those books to be the one adding and subtracted, not the modern Bible versions? What makes you decide that? Are you going by a made-up belief again? You cannot judge other Bibles to be wrong until you have a right Bible. Now, they might say, well, all the modern Bible versions, they're the right Bible. And so by this standard, we can judge all the other Bibles to be wrong, all the other books to be wrong. This is the issue here. You know what God was condemning? God was not condemning Quran or Book of Mormon. Listen up now. God's not condemning that. I'm sure he's including that in 18 and 19. But if you paid attention to 18 and 19, you know what he's judging? He's judging in, in the Bible itself. That's what he's judging by. He's judging in the Bible itself, the right Bible itself, words that are added or subtracted. Do you get that now? We're not talking about Quran, Book of Mormon, or something way out of line there. They're not even in the Bible. But see, all these modern Bible versions, they're in the Bible, right? They all have these, what they argue, same words. God was judging that. God was judging, okay, in the right Bible. I mean, is he talking about the right Bible here at verse 18 and 19? For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. Is that the right Bible? Yes. Verse 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy. Is that the right Bible? Yes. The right book. Not a separate, totally different book out there. The right book. The Bible. God says, what is added? It's not totally different books. It's words. Words that are added in the right book. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. Words that are added in the right book. Then what are they? Come on, tell me what are they? So you can see right here that modern Bible versions, they're all considered to be the Bible, right? And God's saying that the words that are added and subtracted in it, that's, where, that's what you have to watch out for. Now some people might argue, well, no, it's talking about the book of Revelation, not the Bible, at verse 18 and 19. That's a dumb argument. Th that is given by intellectual scholars. Can you believe that? You know why that's a dumb argument? Because let's just say even if it's just the book of Revelation. All right, those words that are added and subtracted in the book of Revelation, the Bible says those are renounced. So who has the book of Revelation? You got NIV, ESV, KJV, and KJV. So we have to pick and choose then. See that? Which book of Revelation in any of those books has the right words. Look, there's, uh, there's no way to escape that. How do you escape that? You want, you want me to give you a simple answer? And onliners too. Do you believe verse 18 and 19? Don't, you know what you're doing? You keep defending. You keep running away from this. Oh, this doesn't count the modern Bible version. The King James Bible has issues. Forget all that. I'm not doing that here. I'm not doing manuscript evidence or pointing out doctrinal errors here. I'm pointing out a common sense gist, which is why you can understand my arguments later on. Do you believe verse 18 and 19 with all your heart? Do you? It's either you do or you don't. That's it. You do or you don't. If you believe... Verse 18 and 19, that God warned about words being added in the Bible. Let's uh, appease our scholars in the book of Revelation, okay? Words that are added or subtracted in it. God says that he doesn't like it, correct? You either believe it or you don't. Okay, if you believe in it, if you believe in it, then you have to tell me which ones qualify as the words who are subtracting and adding in the right Bible. Who are they? Who are they? Come on now, you know. Now, 
understanding that God is talking about words here. You notice that? The Bible says words. Is that what it said? It doesn't say the whole entire book. It says words. 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 That's a big deal. And that's the next part. This goes hand in hand over here. So go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Okay, then if we follow that logic that, okay, then we know that there are words being added in the right Bible. Okay? And words being subtracted out of the right Bible. So then, which one is the right Bible then, right? We have to figure that out. Which one's the right Bible and which one's the wrong Bible that's adding and the uh, wrong Bible that's subtracting the words. See, we have to figure that out for ourselves. If you don't believe verse 18 and 19, then you're going to totally neglect that. You're, that's not going to even pop in your mind at all. You could care less about that. And that shows from your heart of hearts you care less about the right Bible, see. You want to pretend it doesn't exist. You don't want to make a big issue out of that. That's pretty serious, don't you think? Especially if God warned you. That's the final warning He gave to, the, to, to you. Didn't you know that? The final warning in the Bible. So you don't think that's important. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Now, notice what the Bible talks about concerning about His words. He doesn't want it added. And he doesn't want, uh, and he's talking about every single word here. We're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 4. And uh, let's see right here. Verse 2, verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2. The Bible reads, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. See that there? The Bible says, in order to follow His command, you can't subtract or add His words. Amen. That's what people don't pay attention to. How can you obey God? How can you follow His command properly if you add and subtract the word? Oh no, you're making a big deal. All Bibles, the words are pretty much the same there. So we can get a general gist of which commands to follow. But God, He's not looking at a general gist and outlook. He's saying that if you want to follow my command properly, we have to be very specific with every single word. That's what he says here. You might say, nah, he means the basic gist. No, it says, verse 2, ye shall not add unto the word, neither shall he diminish aught from it. Does that sound like a general gist to you, if God gave that command to you? If you're honestly Moses, are you going to think, well, I got the basic message? No, he's going to think word. Because why? You're not, the message is not the word. That's what the modern Bible scholars claim. Verse 2 is not, when God says word, he means the message here, the main point, the message. No, the main point and the message is, right, is the last part of verse 2, the commandments. Right. That's his message. That's his gist. Right. What builds the message and the gist is the Word. Verse 2, every single word. Amen. You don't believe me? Isn't there a difference with, uh, if I told you, uh, wash the dishes versus don't wash the dishes. You think that one word makes a big deal? Yes, it makes a huge deal. Yep. And I'm going to show you from modern Bible versions that one word does make a big deal. Okay, just one word. It makes a big deal. And they don't think it's a big deal. That's a problem here. It's a command. So that's another pointer to consider. Now, people have a problem. They don't believe that it's every single word. That's just a message and a gist. No. Look at this. The message and the gist here is by words. And I mean every single word. Well, I'm going to please the Lord by having a modern Bible version. You might please Him on some things, but not, you're not going to follow His command fully. How can you obey God's command? What God commanded you, what God wants you to do if you change one word? A huge difference with believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved versus believe not on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a huge difference. There's a huge difference. Now, people do not believe that it's every single word, but Deuteronomy 4.2 debunks that. So your first proof text 
is Deuteronomy 4.2. The second one is Proverbs chapter... Um, no, let's go to Matthew. Matthew 7. Matthew 7. Uh, Matthew 5, excuse me. Matthew 5. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 5. Jesus didn't mean like every single word. and No, Jesus did. Matthew chapter 5. Notice that Jesus Christ, he took it as a big deal for each and every single word. He believed that uh, not a single one would pass away. In fact, Jesus Christ, he worded it to the Hebrew law. For some of you who don't know Hebrew law or words, they usually say jot and tittle. That's the word. That every, and what it means by jot and tittle is literally like every single word, okay? That's what it meant, jot and tittle for Hebrew. That's like every single word. So not just the basic message. Look at verse 18, Matthew 5, 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one, see that, jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. How about that? Well, he meant the Hebrew law. No, he meant his words. Look at Matthew. Uh, look at uh, compare this wording, Matthew twenty-four. Uh, Matthew twenty-four. I didn't write this verse down. Hopefully, I remember this. Uh, okay, is it Matthew twenty-four? Let me look at it quickly. It's not twenty-four. Then it might be twenty-five. Matthew twenty-four. All right, I didn't write this down, but uh, so I guess I can't find this passage. But uh, I will quote you the verse, and then. Uh, you can just uh, type down these words and then you'll find the verse uh, real easily. The Bible says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Doesn't that match with Matthew 5, 18? Till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle. That's 2434. Oh, so it is 24. Thank you. 2434? 35. 35, thank you. So notice that verse 35 Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, see that plural, not word as meaning like one message, what people might think, but my words shall not pass away. Amen. What he, see, he, see, he meant words when he meant by one jot or tittle at Matthew 5.18. That's pretty plain. That's very plain. So he argues it's not just Hebrew law, Mosaic law, or something like that. No, by comparing with Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 24, we know that it's more than that. It's talking about the words of God. Ask those scholars, do you believe that you have the word of God in your hand? It's that simple. And then all of them will say, yes, I have the word of God. And then you just simply say this. Then the Bible says, one jot or one tittle, it should not pass away. Why do you believe that one jot or one tittle from the Word of God passed away? Or that it should be changed here and there? Or that uh, it's okay that there are differences and changes? No, Jesus Christ don't want that. There's no doubt about it. He wants every word. Every single word. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Let's also look at Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30, and then we'll read verse 5 and 6. Verse 5 and 6. Proverbs chapter 30, and then we'll look at verses 5 and 6. Now, some people might argue that, well, it's not every single word. No, we looked at the verse, every single word. And by the way, the Bible will make it more plain. It just doesn't say words or jot or tittle. It actually says every, like every, and I mean every, okay, every word. I don't know how you get around that. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5. Most words of God are pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Is that what it said? Nope. It said, the word of God is pure. Or did it say, every? Every. Every word of God is pure. See, don't give me this claptrap about like, oh, it's the word of God, which means the message or the main gist of it. No, the Bible made it more plain. Every single word. Every word. Every word has to be pure. Now, I, I mean, uh, if that's why... Look, do you believe that? It's that simple. Do you believe what that verse says? It's that simple. If you believe that every word of God must be pure, then you're going to understand, oh, then different Bible versions are a big deal. 
they are a big deal then. Right, right. Now, look at, this is more eye-opening. Every word of God is what? Pure. Pure. Okay, so that means there's no error. There's no, nothing wrong there. Right. So then, my question to you then is this, okay? So then, if it has to be pure, the Bible says the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And that's Psalms chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, right? Remember. Right? So understanding that this is referring to the words of the Lord being pure, then a simple question is, is it pure? Let's be honest, is it pure if I teach something blasphemous? No, there's nothing pure about that. Nope. Let me go a little bit more specific now. Is it pure that I teach that you must be water baptized for salvation? It's not believing alone. Nope. Nothing pure about that. You damn a soul. You kidding me? That ain't pure. All right. Let me go further now, okay? Is it pure uh, that I teach that you have to do uh, works for your salvation? No, nothing pure. pure about that, okay? Now, let me uh, give you some examples of different cults, all right? This is not a made-up conspiracy, by the way. Yeah. All right? This proves that every word counts. Let me show you a verse where a Catholic tried to prove water baptism for salvation. Go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Is it pure that I say, oh, you don't have to believe on Christ for salvation. You can just go ahead and get water baptized. So water baptism counts for your salvation. Is that pure of me to say that or is that wrong? That's wrong. That's damnable actually. You damn a soul to hell. All right, a Catholic said that and used this verse to prove it. Acts chapter 8. Notice that your King James Bible says at verse 35, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. See, he's trying to lead him to Christ, to salvation. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Simple. You need to get saved first. You need to believe on Christ. Amen. And then uh, verse, the next verse reads, the very next verse after verse 36 reads, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went both down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Praise the Lord. The eunuch got saved through water baptism. Nope. Did I do that correctly? No. Guess what? The Catholic guy used that passage to prove water baptism for salvation. Did you, did you skip verse 37? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. How about that? These are actual cases. These are not made up. All right. So notice that in Acts chapter 8, verse 36 through 38, People use this as water baptism for salvation. That's, there's nothing pure about that. There are people who use this passage to prove it. If you have a modern Bible version, but if you have a King James Bible, you don't. Alright, let me give you another example. Isaiah 14 and Revelation 22. Let's look at Isaiah 14 and Revelation 22. This, this actually happened. There was a student who went to a university professor and then uh, told her that, uh, you know, that Lucifer and Jesus, that they're the same being. And then she argued no. Uh, and then he used this passage to prove it. All right? He used this passage to prove, Je to prove Jesus and Lucifer are the same. Now let's look at Revelation chapter 22 and we'll read verse 16. Revelation 22 and we'll read verse 16. The Bible says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and what? Morning star. Okay, who is the morning star? Jesus, right? Okay, that's what your King James Bible says. Now look at Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. Now notice what the Bible says here. The Bible says in verse 12, Heart thou fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the morning. Did I read that correctly? Yes, sir. 
Art thou fallen from heaven, O morning star? Did I read that correctly or no? Yes, no, right? Would it be blast? You, you, you would get scared, right? If I said, Pastor, it said Lucifer. Why are you inserting Jesus Christ's name in here, being the morning star? Because that's what your modern Bible versions did. You look up NIV, you look up uh, ESV, you look up the NASV, they say morning star or day star. So you notice here that it's promoting that heresy that uh, Lucifer and Jesus are the same being. And guess what? That that's what the student argued to that university professor. What can she argue back after that? Hey. Hello. Did I get your attention on liners? Some people want to live in ignorance and they want to retain their false Bible. I, oh, no, no, no. I, uh, it's okay. I, I, can, I, I want to keep this, this word, this message, and it's a NIV, ESV, or, whoops, excuse me about that. That, that can go down, not my Bible. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that, that's the right attitude in heart, okay? <laughs> but, anyways. Uh, serious subject at hand. I can't, this is the Word of God. You can't say that the NIV is not the Word of God, the ESV is not the Word of God. It's the precious Word of God. If I said to you, if I said to you that Lucifer and Jesus are the same being, would you count that word as holy or blasphemous? Blasphemous. blasphemous. How can you hold this word that would say, uh, the NIV or an ESV, that would actually say that? Amen. See, you're not having common sense here. You're not having common sense. How can you justify that? Doesn't make sense to me. So, is that pure or not pure? That's not pure. So we're not, see, this is not just making up conspiracy. These are actual cases that, that occur. And you're not looking at, I mean, if I said these words, you find a problem. Uh, but then if uh, you're, your book right here, which is made by Zundervan Publishers or uh, Tyndale House Publishers or whatever with, their, uh, with some different modern Bible versions, I don't know the company's names, but all these different companies that would have it, uh, you're okay with them, huh? What if I put a, simple, what if I put a YouTube title that says, Jesus is the same as Satan, amen. <laughs> simple title, you know. I mean, you would say that's blasphemous. Be careful of wording that. How can a modern Bible translator then, when they're writing the wording here, not be careful of that? I'm giving you common sense cases. I don't understand here. I don't understand. All right, let me give you another one. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then we're going to look at the book of Luke. Luke 16, all right? Luke 16. 1 Corinthians 15 and Luke 16. All right then. So the Jehovah Witnesses, they argue. Now, we, the modern Bible translators, this is one thing I don't understand about them. They'll agree that the Jehovah Witness, uh, the Jehovah Witness Bible is a wrong Bible. But how come they can't say the same thing with their ESV, their NIV, and their other modern Bible versions when they word it the same way? as a Jehovah Witness Bible. Oh, you're making things up. No, look at the scripture here, okay? Now look at the book of Luke chapter 16, all right? You know what Jehovah Witnesses will say when you try to show them the Bible? They're going to correct your King James Bible. Look at Luke chapter 16. And the Bible says in verse 23, And in where? Hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments. Now, when you read Luke 16, 23, you're going to say, so notice the Bible says hell. But Jehovah Witnesses, they don't believe in that. They'll say, oh, no, 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 it's Sheol or Hades. You know why they make a big deal about that? Because they want it, because this is true, it refers as a reference to the realm of the dead. It doesn't refer to actual hellfire itself. Okay? So that's what they're going to argue, is that it's uh, Hades or Sheol. But if you look at your modern Bible versions, the NIV and the other modern Bible versions, see how many times they drop the word hell and replace it with Sheol and they replace it with Hades. 
I don't understand. If you point them a King James Bible and says, see, this is hell right here. You don't want to burn in hell. If a Jehovah Witness said, if a Jehovah Witness said, it's not hell, it's Hades, would you consider that as wrong doctrine? Yes, yes. or no? Okay, I don't understand when the King James Bible says hell, and then the NIV would say, no, it's Hades. I don't understand why you don't think that's uh, wrong doctrine. Why do you think we're making it up? That's a conspiracy. That's not a conspiracy. This is actual real life cases that occur. Otherwise, you didn't really witness to a Jehovah Witness before then. You're just so stuck uh, watching TV and listening to your modern mega churches and listening to all these uh, guru scholars who think that they're smart, but they're not actually smart people because they just talk smart. So then the, they give this kind of language and babble and you just nod your head and you go, oh, oh, it makes sense. And that's why you don't. But you're not out in the real world actually doing soul winning and you don't realize what's going on out there. There are Jehovah Witnesses who do that. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. All right. You know why that's a problem? I'll show you why that's a problem. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. This is death here. This is referring to the realm of the dead here. The Bible says in verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? So notice that uh, this says uh, death and the grave, correct? Now, Jehovah Witnesses, they say, no, it's Hades or Sheol because it's the grave. It's, it's the realm of the dead. It's not actual hellfire. You know the New King James Bible? They, instead of saying grave here, they actually word this as Hades. And then when you look at uh, Luke 16 and other passages that talks about hellfire, you know what they call that? Hades. So you know what they just did? They called Hellfire Hades, they called Grave Hades, and thus the Jehovah Witness doctrine is supported right there. See, hell is the grave. So the New King James Bible, you know what they did with Hellfire? They replaced it with Hades. And you know what the New King James Bible did with 1 Corinthians 15 about the grave? They replaced that with Hades. See, no difference then. There's no difference with hellfire and grave. They're all the same. Hades. Like the Jehovah Witnesses teach. Isn't that blasphemous? It's blasphemous, but no, 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 no. It's uh, not a big deal with my modern Bible version. You're just making it up. No, I'm not making it up. Jehovah Witnesses, when you try to show them a Bible verse about hell, and then it says Hades, you're gonna, the Jehovah Witness will argue back, yeah, it's Hades. It's not hell. It's not hellfire. And you don't think there's a problem? You don't think there's a problem with your NIV, your ESV, your NKJV, modern Bible versions? I don't get that. All right. Another passage. All right, so I, I mean, this is case after case, real life cases that happen. There are actual wrong doctrines promoted and people are just blind to it. And this is not just made up conspiracies, it's actual real life cases that occur. Who would try to put doubt upon the word of God? Who would try to put some, insert some blasphemous teaching right there? Who would want to promote a wrong doctrine? Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And then we'll read verse 16. Also compare that. Nah, we'll stay right here. Alright, 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. I was going to go to 1 John 5, 7, but forget that. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Alright. The Jehovah Witnesses, they want to deny the deity of Jesus Christ. So the Jehovah Witness Bible, it's going to read this. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. He was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on the world, received up into glory. Now you notice I read that wrong, right? So uh, the Jehovah Witness Bible, they get rid of the word God, and they put He was manifest in the flesh. Why? Because if you say God was manifest in the flesh, then you just proved Jesus is God. 
Because when did God ever become human flesh? So, Jehovah Witnesses, that's what they'll use for 1 Timothy 3.16 to argue back against you. The Bible says God was manifest in the flesh. No, 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 no. In the Jehovah Witness Bible, it says He was manifest in the flesh. Well, guess what? Your NIV and your modern Bible versions, they say He was manifest in the flesh. How about that? And you don't think that's a problem? Made up conspiracy? Come on, man. It's not a made-up conspiracy. These are real-life actual cases when you actually do soul winning. By the way, for these dishonest scholars who've done tons of debates with these cults and different scholars, I know this and you know this, you intellectual scholars, you, if you're honest and you, you got involved in debates. Haven't they pulled up Bible verses to support their viewpoint and they relied on these Bible verses? And haven't you guys picked and choose different Bible versions. Why? So that you can find the right wording here that would support your doctrine. Then you have biased doctrines then on both sides. Because they're all picking and choosing the words that they select that would most appropriately fit with their doctrine. You know what that is? That's bias. That's humanism. As a final authority, that ain't the Word of God correcting you. You're correcting the Word of God. You're creating Christian bias. You're creating doctrinal bias. Okay, so we see here that the issue about the deity of Christ is being attacked. Now, another one. Do you believe God is a liar? No, right? God is never a liar. All right. Back to Proverbs 30 again, okay? Didn't you know that if you uh, change words on, in your Bible, that you can actually tell a blatant lie? Oh, no, you're making... Pastor, you're so specific and detailed, like adding a little word here and there is not going to automatically make it a lie. You don't... Proverbs 30... You, uh, I didn't read verse 6, did I? Look at Proverbs chapter 30. Let's read verse 5 again, all right? God says every. Is that correct? Every word? Yes. Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God is pure. So we've covered the purity issues here, okay? But we haven't finished... Verse 6, add thou not unto his words. Why? And that means every word, right? So you can't add just a single word right there. Why? Keep reading. The verse says, lest he reprove thee and thou be found a what? Liar. 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 God says so. I didn't say so. So notice that God accuses you of lying if you add. Right. If you don't think that every single word counts, then you can produce a lie. You can lie. And I lie, all right? You lie. No, you just made it up. <sighs> okay. Go, go, to, uh, uh, go to Mark 1. Mark 1. This is going to be found in the majority of your modern Bible versions, all right? Majority of your modern Bible versions. Go to Mark 1. Here go. Mark chapter 1. Second one, go to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 21. Chapter 21. And then the third one, third one, John chapter 7. John chapter 7. Mark 1, John 7, and 2 Samuel 21. Notice that they made God a liar in these three passages. All right. Mark chapter 1, all right, pay attention to every word now, all right? Verse 2, verse 2. Mark 1, 2. As it is written in Isaiah, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Did I read that correctly? No, it said prophets, right? Yep, prophets. You know why? Because... Isaiah is quoting verse 2, and Malachi is quoting verse 3. You know what the modern Bible version said? As it is written in Isaiah, 
Isaiah quoted verse 2, and Isaiah quoted verse 3. No, Malachi said verse 3. All right, if you want, uh, I'm just going to uh, say this real quickly, all right, because I'm not going to give you the passage, but it's Malachi 3, 1, and then the other one is Isaiah chapter, uh, oh, was it 40? Yeah, Isaiah chapter, 40, verse three. yes, thank you, Isaiah 43, all right. So it's Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, Malachi 3, 1. All right, I'm not going to continue onward there, but point is, is that, so it proves here that Malachi is quoting, but they just got rid of that. Then, did Isaiah quote verse 3? Simple, a simple question. No, he didn't, right? Then, you just made a liar. Oh, there's no pretty way around that, okay? There's no pretty way around that. Ralph would be verily offended if he preached a very good sermon and then it was attributed to me and that was my sermon, all right? And uh, Pastor Gene Kim, he's the one that preached that message. And then Ralph would go, no, I was the one that made up that sermon, that message, that idea, right? That's like, that's, you know, so, see, I mean, uh, wouldn't, isn't that why we have like these copyright laws too? Yeah, why is this, why do we do that? Because it's offensive. Yeah. It's offensive. It's messed up. That's why they even put laws here and they punish you for that. Yeah. Except modern Bible versions. They can be free from penalty. And they don't think it's a big deal. Then why do we even have laws concerning that then? About pe penalizing people who take credit when it's actually not theirs. It's my work. It's my invention when it's not yours. Alright, 2 Samuel 21. 2 Samuel 21. Amen, brother. All right, 2 Samuel chapter 21. And then we'll read verse 19. Verse 19. All right. And there was again a battle in God with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Jerirorigim, a Bethlehemite, slew Goliath the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Did I read that correctly? No, it says the brother of Goliath the Gittite. Why? Because David killed Goliath, not Elhanan. They might say, well, you know, uh, Elhanan is a different word for a different person. And, you know, the brother of is in italics. They didn't read 1 Chronicles 20 verse 4. All right? If you read uh, 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 20, it actually took, got rid of the italics and says Elhanan slew the brother of Goliath. So in modern Bible versions, this is so funny, modern Bible versions are going to tell you that Elhanan, at 1 Chronicles 20 verse 5, he slew the brother of Goliath, and then in 2 Samuel 21, the modern versions will say, but Elhanan slew Goliath. Well, which one, dummy? <laughs> Modern Bible versions contradict themselves now. Amen. All right? So the second passage, if you want to know, is 1 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 5. All right? 1 Chronicles 20, verse 5. So the modern Bible versions contradicted them each other. Right. right. They contradicted each other. Why do you want a Bible like that? I don't understand. See that? Then what are, are you being honest or dishonest? Dishonest. Liar. What did Jesus Christ said? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy what? Word is truth. Is that true or not true then, what they just did? Totally. I, you, you got, throw away that Bible. All right, go to John 7. John 7. John chapter 7. Now notice that Jesus, what he said here, at John chapter 7, at verse 8, okay? John chapter 7, verse 8. Your King James Bible reads, Go ye up unto this feast, I go not up, what? Yet, unto this feast. Okay, that's very important. Jesus says, I'm not going yet to the feast. What does that mean to you? That means, oh, he's going to go later, right? All right. And did he go later? Yeah, he went later at verse 10. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. See that? He went later. All right. What if Jesus says, go ye up unto this feast, I go not unto this feast. What if he said that, and then verse 10, he did go to the feast. 
Then is he lying or is he... Yeah, he's lying. No, he's not lying. He was just, he was just what? What? What if I told you, what if I told you, no, I'm not going to church, okay? And then you see me at church all of a sudden. Then you, you know what you're going to say? Oh, you, you changed your mind. Good for you, all right? You're going, uh, if I said, no, I'm not going to the rock, uh, uh, I'm not going to the death metal concert. That's not right with God. And then uh, you see me over there later on, then you're going to go, you're a liar, you know? <laughs> but if I say, I didn't go yet, I'm not going yet, and then I did go later, then I'm not lying. Right. Guess what the modern Bible versions did? One word made a huge difference. Go ye up unto this feast, verse 8. I go not up unto this feast. They dropped the word yet. What did, you don't believe Proverbs, do you? You don't believe Proverbs. Every word of God is perfect. Add not, not thou unto it, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a what? Liar. Liar. You do not believe Proverbs 30, period. You know what you're going by? Your flesh, your bias, your preconceived belief. What makes you different from a Muslim and a Catholic who's just as sincere, just as loves their God so much, and appreciates Jesus, and probably lives better than a lot of you Christians, what makes you different from them? In having, in, in having a preconceived bias to cling on to that they don't want to give up. What makes you different from them? You want to hold on to your religion. That's your made up religion. Then, Oh, I love Jesus. I'm walking with Jesus. I'm growing with him. No. Command. You can't grow without following his command. And his command changes when you don't have the right word. Amen. You want evidence? I'll tell you evidence. Why are you onliners subscribed and watching my channel? Why don't you watch all the other modern Bible version channels out there? You know why? They're not teaching you doctrine. You haven't heard stuff before until you heard from me, right? And I don't mean I'm an arrogant person. I mean that as in a sad fact that out of all other channels you would find me. When there are tons and hundreds of, and thousands of Bible believers and pastors out there who are teaching stuff and who have even, uh, who haven't, who found deeper doctrines than I did. Why don't you just watch those guys' channels, huh? Go to their churches. Why do you come to mine? Why do you watch my stuff? You know why? Because I'm teaching you something that you haven't heard before. A doctrine or a command of God. Why? Because I take every word seriously. And you know that. I know you onliners know that. And people in this church know that. You know that from my style. I go by every word. Amen. Amen. And then you find something in the doctrine where you go, Oh, I didn't recognize that before. Right? Every word is serious. Alright, so every word of God is pure. You have to follow it. Go to 1 Corinthians 14. And then we'll look at John chapter 8. We're going to look at John chapter 8. And then we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Let's be honest, okay? Let's be very honest here. So, is God a liar or no? Okay. God, is God the author of lies or no? Is he the father of lies or no? Okay, who is the father of lies? Who is the author of lies? Satan, right? Satan, okay. Uh, I have another question, okay? Uh, is God confusing or is he clear? He's clear. He's of clarity. He's of simplicity. You know who's of confusion? The devil, right? We know that. The Bible says that uh, the serpent beguiled you so that you can get away from the simplicity that is in Christ. Right? We know that passage. So that's the devil's job, all right? So the devil's job is he's the author of confusion, right? He's the author of confusion. He's the author of lies, correct? All right. John chapter 8, verse 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, <coughs> for he is a liar, and the what? Father. father of it. Is God truly the father of this lie here? Yes or no? Simple. No. Then who is the father 
of lies. Oh, you can't put it that way. No, he's the father of lies, all lies. Is this lie or truth? Lie. Then who's in charge of that? Satan. And don't you dare say Jesus. How dare you, some of you Christians, say it's from Jesus then? How dare you waste your time reading those kind of books that show a lie? It's good, brother. That's why onlineers, I'm King James only. You see that? That's why church, you see I'm King James only? Amen. You see why I make a big deal? I don't. 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. Notice what the Bible says here. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. The Bible reads verse 33. For God is not the what? Author of confusion. All right. Is this confusing what we all looked at? Yes, it's confusing. All right. Who, who, who are the authors writing it in those modern Bibles? Ah, hello. Who's the authors writing that confusion? Thank you. Someone's being honest right there. <laughs> so, verse 33, For God is not the author of confusion, then is Satan. Alright. So, that's why we make a big deal. I would like to close with one verse if people don't see the Bible as such a big deal. Okay? Simple question. Uh, do you believe uh, that the name of Jesus is precious? Okay. Duh. Okay. <laughs> what are you going to say? No. You know? <laughs> so... <laughs> But guess what? Some modern Bible version people would say no and be so dull to say it. You know why? Let me give a comparison here. Okay? Okay. It's a dull state. Uh, I have to draw it. Why? Because people don't get it until I draw. It's so sad. All right? I have to make it super duper clear. All right? Let me write the word duh here. Okay? All right? Now, with duh... The name of Jesus, the name of God, is holy, correct? Yes. All right. Uh, if we change, amend, or take that name in vain, or disgrace that name, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's bad. It's dull, okay? Yeah. It's a dull statement. I don't understand why you don't do that with his word when his word is higher than his own name. Oh, you just made that up. You're a bibliolater. You worship the Bible. I'm not worshiping the Bible. You ever read the book of Psalms? Uh, you can write this and then see it uh, uh, word for word, but the Bible says that uh, thy word is above thy name in the book of Psalms. Yeah. Didn't you know that? Thy word is above thy name. Just search word Psalms, word above thy name. Okay, and then look at that verse then I don't get it. If you think it's duh with his name, why is it not duh with the NIV that you should know that that's a disgrace and you should reject it? That's a duh with the ESV that's a disgrace and you should reject it. That the NSV, NASV, it's a disgrace and it's a duh thing that you should reject it. Oh no, I can't do that. Then what about the name, huh? Why don't I uh, disgrace the name of Jesus? Oh no, no, you should never do that. Some of you would uh, scold your children, right? For taking God's name in vain? For disgracing the name of Jesus? It's a dull thing, but you don't do that with His Word? That's higher than His own name? You know why? You know why? I'll tell you why. John 1.1. 1, 1. His name is the Word. Amen. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. It's more than just a name. It's His very own being in essence. Amen. So then, I hope that you onlineers and people in church will understand why you should be, why you have to. It's, it's a have to. You have to be King James only. I know tons and thousands of arguments out there. You know, they'll point out manuscript evidence, textual criticism, oh, King James Bible, there was a Mandela effect, and it changed things here and there and there and there and there. Okay, one simple answer, okay? All right? All this stuff, look in our playlist called Defending the KJV. If you just click on that playlist, we'll look through all the videos, it debunks all of that. Okay? You can even search word Mandela Effect uh, with my name, Gene Kim, alright? And then uh, you'll find me arguing. 
So, look, I know all the criticisms out there, and I could have done that. I could have addressed every KJV argument, but I've been doing that for the past years, and you still won't believe me, you onliners. So I have to do something like this to get you studying, finally, and say, okay, let's see if he's right that... The textual criticism is right here. If there really is an error in the King James Bible right here, if uh, the manuscript evidence supports the King James Bible, if the King James Bible didn't really change, why don't you study finally, huh? You know why? You don't study. You know why? You're lazy. You know why? You don't care about the Word of God. No, I care about the Word of God. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. If you really care about the Word of God, you study. Alright, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, I pray that the people will not take this as an offense, but they'll take this as a challenge that they will look, that they will examine and study. And please open their eyes. I pray that this teaching has got them started. It'll get them to open their eyes. It'll get them to seek truth. And then uh, I pray that you'll please touch their hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.